Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we love geeky wisdom. If you're joining us live, then you must be a member of the Guardians of Getica playtest, and if so, thank you very much for all of your feedback. Uh, today, we're actually going to be jumping in pretty soon, pretty early in this uh, live stream, to actually go in and start making some updates. I've got some ideas of, of things that I wanted to try out, and yeah, so let's let's see what I can pull together. But if you're in the chat, uh, jump in with your own suggestions of how we can improve things. I'm going to start us out with some of the takeaways that we had from the playtest survey to kind of just get the ball rolling. I've also got pulled up um, all of the different adventures that we have put together already as sort of a baseline so I can jump back and forth into those as needed to kind of show some of you who haven't seen some of what we've put together so far. You can get a chance to take a look at it as we go through, but really the focus is this being a working session. I'm gonna be typing a lot. I'm gonna be talking through some things and yeah, hopefully uh, we'll make some improvements as we go. The one thing I will mention is that if you're watching this after the fact, please comment if you've got any suggestions too, because then I can kind of go in and review what you're saying in the comments and see if we can make some adjustments there. Disclaimer, uh, this is still uh, geek philosophy setting. So while I am going to take all the comments and suggestions into consideration, I still want it to be something I'm proud of. So uh, if it doesn't mesh with what I'm thinking the setting should be, even though I've taken a lot of ideas from the group already, but if it doesn't mesh with what I think the setting uh, needs to be, then don't worry. You should take that and run with it in your home game. Take it and use it and test it out. And then that way you've got your own play test information that you can come back to me and say, hey, this is how it worked out. And, you know, maybe you'll change my mind. I don't know. But uh, let's let's get rolling. Let's see. So we have. Oh, great. Uh, this is perfect because uh, let's see here. Oh, it's not showing on screen the way I like. This is the way it works when you have, uh, you know, an issue with the way the screen share is supposed to be so I'm just gonna have to call out the actual comments rather than display them so sorry everybody but we've got a couple people already so well we've got lovely uh, crystal uh, in the chat along with Ethan so this is great because they're my playtesters here at the house we've been running through the campaigns uh, that we've been putting out um, each adventure so they can give you honest feedback as we're going well slightly biased but honest feedback as a, a player and from a player's perspective playing both a guardian and an elder in the uh, one shots that we're doing or the series that we're doing we've also got ben which is great uh man great to see you live on here too i'm glad you could make it so always throw in your feedback as we go this is really exciting i was hoping we'd at least get a couple coming in so this is amazing. So thanks so much. I'm going to try to bring the comments in, but uh, it didn't work. Sorry, guys. I'll get this fixed by next time. For some reason, my overlays aren't working the way they're supposed to. All right. So let's jump in, shall we? So here are some notes. And this was in the playtest uh, video that I released. So I'll note to it in the comments below somewhere after I'm done, where you can actually go through and see the video where I went through all the playtest results, the first round of playtest results. And this is what kind of everything boiled down to. There was uh, the need or the desire to enhance the frights. There was, uh, you know, let's update the setting, the presentation, the materials. 100% agree with that. And also exploring and expanding the lore and the backstory of the setting which this is all great feedback. I'm going to dive into each one of these and probably type under the bullets as we go. Uh, but let's let's start with the frights. And uh, I'll ask the chat to um, add some comments to this as we go through. But the first thing I wanted to uh, kind of mention is that one of the things that was popping up from a few different people was more clarification about how the frights work in game. So I'm going to no note some things, but I'm also going to explain it here for the people in the chat first to make sure it makes sense. And then that way, if any other questions come up, um, we can see what I can do to explain more and I can add that to my notes. But my vision for the Frights is that they are these entities, and we'll get to the lore and the backstory later if we have some time, but these entities that exist in the campaign setting, they're only perceivable or recognizable by 
young people and elders. So we've got our guardians that are able to perceive and remember, and then elders in later years are able to remember their existence and then also perceive them if they come across them in their daily life. It's that middle gap of being an adult uh, right after adolescence and, and teenage years and right before you become an elder, whatever that means to you in your campaign world, that doesn't have the perception of them. It doesn't mean that the frights don't exist in a world that have regular D and D monsters. So you can put this in Forgotten Realms. You could put it in Dragonlance. You could put it in uh, Wild Mount if you're a fan of Critical Role, but you want to do a kids version within that campaign setting. Um, you can put it in Pathfinder. You can put it in any uh, world you like. The idea is that they exist within the world and all the heroes that are the grown adults that are able to see everything anyway the regular monsters are going out there and they're battling them but who's taking care of the world for the frights or against the frights that's the guardians and the elders so there's still the ability to have this sort of in parallel with what's going on so that's my idea for what the frights are at their core um and that kind of goes into differentiating between the frights and other monsters and then additional types of frights was another thing. So one way that I wanted to be able to make easy frights, that it's easy for a DM to go in there and say, uh, I want a fright to put together for my game, is to reskin an existing, you know, maybe traditional monster and turn it into a fright. Uh, that way you don't have to make up statistics. You don't have to go and uh, you know, do all the number crunching. You can take something that's already designed for a certain level character and then make it work. The good example of this, and I'm going to jump over to Rusty Menace, uh, which was one of the... Awesome. I'm, I'm getting comments as we go, so if I jump back and forth, this is why. So Ben says, central concept for the frights is great uh, for the setting. My kids found it was easy to engage. Oh, awesome. I'm glad that that is your experience too. And then also with this, like a good example, and I think you played through this, Ben, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that Crystal and Ethan played through the Rusty Menace, but with the Rusty Menace, what I did was I made a fright that was essentially, and I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom, we called it the Iron Bane fright in, in this uh, uh, adventure. The Iron Bane frights look very similar to uh, a rust monster. It's basically a rust monster from d and I reskinned it to be Iron Bane Fright. Um, and uh, I also made it uh, take the form, like instead of it being invisible to the people of the town, it took the form of a stray dog. So everybody could see the actual creature walking around, but it, to them, it looked like a dog. But to the uh, guardians and to the elders it looked like this fright like you know this purplish dark energy uh almost um rust monster type creature right so i was able to use all the stats of rust monster pretty much and i just made it vulnerable to a stary steel and iron a stary steel and ironwood and then whistling sounds was something i just threw in to make it fun for the people to be able to build into the lore so um yeah so great so uh this was one that ben played through so I, I think this kind of encapsulates what I was going for with the Frights. So I'm mainly mentioning this just to kind of set the stage for what I'm hoping to do when we come up with other ideas for Frights, um, because that's one of the other things that we said. So let me come back to here. Um, I'm going to jump down to this bullet. Anybody in the, fr in the chat have some ideas of what we could do for additional Frights or maybe something... Ben, you decided to do with your table uh, or anybody else in the chat or Crystal or Ethan, if you have ideas for frights, um, let me know because I think there's a bunch that we could do, right? So I'm going to give it a second while I'm also pulling up notes on my computer. So let me... Yeah, this was one of our favorite frights. That's, that's awesome. I'm glad that, that worked out pretty well. Um, let me pull up some notes that I already had um, just to make sure that we're not getting too stuck on waiting for feedback. And also there's a delay in what I say and what you guys respond to. So, all right. For me, uh, I wanted to make sure that we were staying consistent with the rules and the abilities of the frights. 100% understand that. Um, I think that by kind of putting together more stat block examples, it'll be easier to kind of 
make the stats work better, or at least uh, a lot more examples, the more adventures I can release in this setting. Um, but also uh, maybe just clarifying, you know, I'll put this up under these notes. Um, what are the main rules uh, of the game for frights? How can you sort of reskin? I think there's a dash. <laughs> reskin an existing monster. Maybe there's not. Let's do it that way. Great. Um, yeah, awesome. Oh, uh, Ethan is saying a dire wolf pack. I love it. So dire wolves, uh, dinosaurs. Awesome. Yeah, and and what's cool about this is if the latest Jurassic Park movie comes out, you don't have to say that the um, that the fright that they're facing is a Velociraptor. You can just describe it in the way a, Veros a Velociraptor works. Um, because we do have stats for that in D&D for dinosaurs and everything, so that's an easy fix, too. Um, the disguise mechanic of the Iron Brain Fright was one I ported over. No, 100%. That's great. The disguise mechanic is great. Um, uh, I think... Disguide. Here we go. Let me try to type too fast. So, um, let's. Exp I'll explain that a little bit better just to make sure when I go through and put out the next version of this, I have a little bit more crunch to that to explain how that works. But I think it's totally something. I'm glad you were able to use that. You ported it over to an assassin NPC. It's amazing, right? Like you can take something and uh, grab the idea and move it over to something else. Uh, we've got another idea for types of frights, large birds of prey. Love it. And this is cool because, um, I could, you could potentially uh, have a large bird of prey be a normal bird of prey or look to everyone else like a normal bird of prey, but to the rest of the uh, guardians or the younger kids and the elders, it looks like something completely different. And uh, that could, you know, it, it's sort of the same type of thing with a disguise mechanic. I think the disguise mechanic is probably something that's the easiest way to leverage um, that idea of it is something that exists and people can see, but that's not its true identity. Um, I do want to mention this. This isn't something that I laid into uh, too much detail with when I put out the first play test, but I also want to mention that, and I'll throw this out there for, especially you, Ben, because you're running games, but also for you, Crystal and Ethan, as far as how, how you're, you're thinking of this. I think sometimes frights can be more than just a creature. Um, frights could be a spell effect. Frights could be a curse, like on the land. Frights could be a, a blight on crops. It could be um, bad luck in an area. Like they could take the form of something other than a specific creature, right? So if you play 5e, for example, and I'm just throwing this out there because it's a lot of people play 5e, you could use this with any other mechanic you'd like, but you could have it so that uh, frights are causing an entire uh, town to have bad luck. And what that might mean is every roll that's made in that town is done at disadvantage until the frights are uh, conquered or whatever the, the um, you know, whatever the theme is of that fright is defeated. So um, I really like that concept of taking things that are not necessarily monsters and then making them into uh, some other thing that needs to be conquered because to me role-playing games are more than just combat so it may mean collecting a certain um you know number of artifacts that you know cure the town of some plague or some curse or lift the curse from whatever's going on um so there's a lot of different things that we could do again the, the for me it's uh how can we make this something that kids can really kind of gravitate to. I always remembered like, uh, oh, by the way, this is this is a, a, a deep cut here. Um, you, you know by now that we have a Asteri Steel and um, Ironwood as the things that defeat the Frights. I have not written the backstory of why that is other than my thought is that there may have been a meteor that landed and it's the star, like it's the ore from that meteor that is the Asteri steel, 
And it also landed in the uh, ironwood forest. And because of that, the roots kind of grow and all that stuff. And it makes the ironwood drawn from that for forest also um, powerful against them. So just something to think about. But uh, proficiency fright makes PCs roll without proficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So things that you could t uh, use mechanically, like you could hinder certain abilities or, um, you know, uh, a mist that uh, if you're familiar with the whole Ravenloft thing uh, in D&D &D, where there's a mist that tra transports you somewhere, how about a mist that takes uh, away all of your dark vision and you can't you can't see the way it was before. You can only see using torchlight or whatever it is. So um, yeah, it could be a little crunchy for kids. So, you know, peel it back <laughs> to a level that makes sense for your game. We haven't gotten there yet, and it's one of the things that I really want to eventually uh, jump into, but um, the presentation and materials, there's probably a whole nother setting or uh, part of this setting. I'm going to create another category here um, and call it game mechanics. Um, see, this is tricky. Uh, what I mean by this is I have produced some things in the playtest packet let's see if i can that are very crunchy in the form of like classes i put together a protector class the explorer class uh keeper class these are drawn from 5e D, &D um slightly influenced by what um was done with the sidekick mechanic to kind of pare down uh the leveling and things like that I don't know how much I want to go into creating a whole new game, right? Like I, I think that it's more the setting that I'm leaning into. So while I wanted to make sure there was something in there in the playtest to use, if you weren't going to be jumping into uh, a new game system, or something I wanted to at least have the feel for it. I'm thinking about uh, potentially just converting this stuff to be more lore and flavor and less crunch of the class so that people feel like they can use whatever game system they'd like to use so that they don't feel like it's too heavily influenced by 5e um i just throwing that out there as an idea i could really dig in deeper with the background story of each one of these quote-unquote classes uh, but then someone playing pathfinder could use pathfinder someone could use you know 5e and do whatever um but uh swing and a miss fright forces a fumble uh table miss. yeah yeah that's great like <laughs> something that causes uh um a fumble if pc misses an attack i love it yeah that's great um but anyway this is just something i wanted to mention that you know game mechanics i either need to go completely system agnostic or um, build a light uh, or rules light system is probably the way I should put it. Um, I don't know how much I want to build a new system as much as I'd rather build a setting. I, I don't know if, if uh, Ben, if you're familiar with um, uh, Sly Flourish and Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of that whole idea and one of the things that he's always looking for um is uh you know setting information and lore and ideas like this but less i want you know four new subclasses or something because everybody can do those the the idea is the setting can be used for whatever game system you'd like so just throwing that out there, my next playtest packet may be less about the rules mechanic, more about the story behind what we would consider those roles to be in the, the role-playing game. Um, all right, also, uh, I uh, do, do want to jump back to this, differentiating between the frights and other monsters that exist in the setting. Um, this is something uh, that is intentionally vague on my part because... Uh, if you're playing with younger kids that really want to face a dragon, I think they should face a dragon. Um, but maybe the dragon or the fright is taking the form of a dragon to to be whatever it needs to be. You know, like to, to just give that flair and that uh, flavor. Uh, we did something similar um, in our game here. But, 
you know, uh, it, just something to think about, like how to separate between the two. Um, and also, no one's going to remember their battle with the dragon when they get older until they're an elder. So uh, it's interesting. So, okay, got to confess, we moved on to full 5e classes. Awesome. Uh, it's definitely too complex for six-year-olds, but maybe nine-year-olds too, but they love the flavor of being a barbarian druid. I think that's perfect. You should do that. I think you should play the game that you love to play. Um, there are rules light uh, games that are out there. Uh, one that works perfectly for this, I think. Uh, I'm going to be reviewing um, some of their stuff soon. There is a, uh, a group called D&D Adventure Club that puts out uh, a adventure monthly and they're skinned down to be the basics of how uh, the system runs is very rules light uh, it gives the wide variety of classes and characters that you could create um, but it's also designed to be something that kids can learn how to run and be the DM instead of leaning on the parents to do it so I'm gonna review that and kind of give some feedback on it but it seems like a perfect match for pulling some of those adventures and then just modifying the creatures and the the foes to be frights uh, because they're already based on that system. So again, I don't want to do heavy lifting where other people have already done the work of being game designers much better than I could do. So um, the other things um, I wanted to mention too is there's some things that we can do to expand the backstory, but I, I think what I'm going to do is propose these are potential backstories that you could use for this game but you should really adapt them for your home world especially if you've got a campaign setting that you're using for the adults and you want your kids to eventually graduate into that homebrew campaign setting uh, you should feel free to adjust the backstory but here are some things that um you know i'm kind of thinking of i've got some separate notes but i'll um bring it so like one of the things was uh you know maybe the lore of the frights were the frights are all manifestations of fear that have existed and they didn't have any real form or substance, but there's some type of forbidden magic or unknown entity that gave these um, manifestations of fear the ability to appear, but they can only prey upon those that um, had the ability to sense them so it could be that children and the elders start to remember it and as they get older so things like that might be a good way to go um another idea is the guardians could have been started and in this setting is based on my home campaign world there is a whole kingdom called getica which is where this came from but uh in getica it could have been the first king of getica uh, that started this because he had a vision of a fright or, or the first queen, whatever it is, uh, had a vision of the fright. And then uh, before he forgot, he uh, maybe he was a young boy that was be about to be coronated and he started as one of his first acts as king or if it's a girl, the first act as queen um, started this organization to keep the idea alive because they knew um, that they were going to need protection in the realm. So something like that, like, um, you know, just some idea of, of, of how we can build lore. And so I'm going to throw a few ideas and maybe I'll have multiple in the next play test and the home brew, uh, campaign world can pick the ones they like the best and go with that. Um, so let me, let me pause there for a second. Any ideas from your perspective of what we should do around any, you know, backstory of why there are frights, why the guardians are fighting them. Anything from your perspective? I'll give it a second because I know there's a little delay between when you hear me and when you can start typing. So um, let me just kind of check here. And I'll keep an eye on my notes too because I'm gonna. Oh, I also have. Uh idea that we should have uh, trials of the guardians like where the guardians have different ranks based on the year they're in and you could have a whole uh, you know adventure on guardian trials where they have to go collect uh, three folk tales about or compose three stories that will help keep the guardians or the the frights at bay or banish two 
uh, frights from two different areas or something like that. So we could, you know, get into that later. But okay, our setting has an elderly king that knows what all the guardians are fighting. That is perfect. Um, I love that. It also uh, the elderly king idea is great because they have power to make things move. So having the elderly king as the uh, you know the king of Getica or whatever. You know, I'm saying Getica because it's mine, but you can change it to the Guardians or whatever for your own home world. Um, I think that's a, a great way to do it. Uh, what's another idea here? Old superstitions that have gained realistic foothold. I love it. So like the foot, the superstitions that may have been just superstitions actually started to to manifest into a reality of sorts. Um, and then the way that the Guardians end up battling against them are creating new superstitions that are warding against all these things these rhymes these songs the you know you know like even in our world like in, if we watch shows like supernatural or others where they put salt around the, the entryway to a building so things can't come in maybe that's a real thing that you can use for the campaign um let's see we ran a games day episode which had all the guardians competing for prizes i love it <laughs> this is great it's almost like having like a a field day event for at the, at the Guardians. That's an amazing way to do this. And there's so many things that you could, what I love about this too, is that um, you can take ideas from just our real world, especially if you have kids that are coming up and they're doing things in school. Uh, if they're going on field trips, uh, you can make field trips a part of the world if they're going on or if they're doing events like uh the school fair or the school projects you can make an adventure out of the school project and then it makes it very close to what they're already used to in life and it just makes it uh really fun for them so um negative superstitions combated by positive ones yeah absolutely like just being able to keep the um the battle of the um and it's really about intention, right? Like when you think about super, superstitions to me, it's around intentionality. It's trying to say, I do this because I'm trying to stop something from happening or I'm doing this because I want something to happen, right? Like even the whole, you know, break a mirror seven years, bad luck, or you, you know, throw the salt over your shoulder, all those things, um, they started from somewhere and it was likely because you wanted to make something occur or stop something from happening. The Cub Scouts cover really worked for us. Yeah, thank you so much. One of my original, um, you know, way back when I was first playing D&D, &D, uh, my original game group um, back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, one of my good friends from that group ended up being a veterinarian and also really heavily into the Boy Scouts of Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts of America and became a scout leader. And so he was my inspiration for really throwing that idea out is because I knew how much he was doing with that and he played D D. And so just that idea of like, you know, all of the campfire stories and all of the the earning the badges and um, you know, all the things that are around uh that really kind of set home for me. And it gives a good cover for uh you know what the rest of the world is thinking when these people are out on an adventure like why would you let kids go out and do this stuff well because they're on a, a scouting trip so to speak with their elder um which makes it um you know a really good way to do it so i love it awesome um other thing that i just want to kind of throw in there is i'm going to try to put in a little bit more detail let me go to so here with game mechanics, I'm going to lean into the roles and have uh, guardian ranks, meaning apprentice, uh, you know, full guardian, so on. Like so that, you know, there's a way for them to level up their title as they play. Um, a little bit easier a little bit more click uh, a little a little bit more well thought out from my part i'm going to try to make this something that we can do i'm also you know as much as i throw into this i also then have to take a step back and go all right what's too heavy with this i want to make sure that i'm having enough that you can just run with it so um 
I think for me, the thing that really helps, and it's always been this way for me, is to see something in action. So the adventures are a way for me to at least have a story laid out. And I don't want to railroad the players, but if you can get an example of here's what something might feel like in that world. Um, you know, a good example here, the creepies of Willow Creek was one, of, I think the first one that we did, um, you know, and they talk to different people and then they also can do some checks to figure out, you know, what was the lore around these night frights. So, um, yeah, so this is something I want to lean into more. I want to flesh this stuff out, um, and plan to with the next couple of, uh, next couple of releases here. So. Uh, Fright's Origin, an ancient civilization that died out, similar to the Guardians or Zonai and the Zelda games. Yeah, that's a really great uh, idea, too. So, um, make sure I didn't lose any. So, we had superstitions. And we've got ancient civilization that died out that'll help me remember it too yeah that's a great idea um what's what's interesting is i have so many ancient civilizations in my homebrew campaign world it wasn't the first thing that popped in my brain that's not saying it's not a good one it's just and you can see it, by the way, if you're ever curious, uh, we had a Relics of the Ancients campaign when we first started this channel or very early on. Live stream was as good as we could get it at that time, but I thought the campaign went really well and we had uh, Crystal played in it. We had uh, one of my best friends, Carrie, played in it. He was with my original gaming group way back in the day. And then we had a new player. Uh, Melanie, who was brand new to playing D&D or role-playing in gen general, and she first started playing with the live stream. So uh, I took guts to do, and she did an amazing job. But I had a whole ancient civilization in the world, and uh, that was kind of what was going on in that campaign. So, um, yeah. Oh, aliens. No, totally could be. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, agreed. Railroading is generally bad, but necessary for the ranges that I'm running for. No, 100%. I think... Um, and, and I love the aliens uh, comment there, Crystal. So I think it's true. Like, uh, I think having it, I think sometimes having a story is mislabeled as railroading. I think um, having a very clear story um, kind of planned out as far as here's what's happening in the adventure is something that even the professionals do, right? Like, there's books on my shelf over there that are printed adventures published by Wizards of the Coast and other companies, and they're not railroading. They're just laying out a plot, and they're letting you use these resources to go everywhere. And I think an adventure should be that. It should be at least a general structure to a story, because if they make a choice to go somewhere different, the information that they find out should all you know match what's going on with the events of that region, right? Like, what's going on? So... Yeah, and so sometimes it takes a little bit of nudging to help a new player learn what to do, especially when they're younger. So I don't think there's, um, you know, I don't think there's too much uh, trouble with doing a, a slight bit of railroading to kind of keep someone understanding how the game works. So um, awesome. So that was Ace really hooked me on the channel. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed that. So and uh, and that's how the Asteri Steel works. Yeah, it could work. It could work that the Asteri Steels are coming came down and uh, maybe the aliens uh, are from the similar thing. There was this is like showing my age a little bit. There was an old module when they called a module and I can't remember what it was where you played through the module uh, it was back when Wizards of the Coast wasn't doing D&D. It was actually back in the TSR days. And you played through the, the game. And as a DM, you were describing things and you were going through. And they found this um, uh, sort of really mystical, uh, sleek looking tomb or structure. And they went in and the doors would slide open. And they would go through and 
you know, uh, like runes and glyphs would magically light up on the wall. And you just describe things like that. But it turns out in that module, it was a crashed alien spacecraft. And that's what they were exploring. But because the characters of that time period and of, of that type of world would not know what that is. It's interesting how if you describe those things, it, you know, it's like that old thing. It's any advanced civilization and technology looks like magic to those that don't have it. Right. So like you go through and here's this thing. So you, we totally could take this in a whole nother realm um, if you wanted to and make this be from another planet or aliens or all kinds of stuff. You could do what you want. Um, I think it's a great, it's a great idea. Man, all right, so this is a lot of good ideas. I haven't been typing as much on all of this stuff, uh, mainly because I'm sort of also going to use the recording of this as a way of going back because the conversation from the chat that I'm watching and the ideas popping up is just really good. Um, one of the things I think I also want to lean in on is the, let's see, I like the Asteri still concept, but found that 5e makes things too easy and they have uh, much advantage on the attacks. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think you're right. Like it can be overdone. Um, yeah. So I uh, maybe that's something I need to work on here is to explain that Asteri seal, uh, maybe it's, it's almost better to treat it not as the advantage or that it does more damage or any of those things, but maybe treat it like the way werewolves or undead creatures are treated, where like you can only damage them with magic or silver. Men mundane weapons don't do damage to them. So maybe that's the way to treat it. So like it's it does regular damage, but it on the only damage that can be done are magic a stereo steel or ironwood instead of it being extra damage or whatever it might be and that the other stuff doesn't do damage at all um, that might be a way to kind of reel it back in a little bit because it could be that 5e if you're playing it that way um, does that that's that's interesting i'll have to go back i'll go back and look at the mechanics surround like uh, werewolf is a good example because of the whole um you know silver and and that kind of thing so maybe that's a way to go with it um all right, so I am going to, because I'm going to do several of these, I'm going to, um, so finishing blow has to be with a stereo steel. That's a good way to do it. Like you can knock them down to a certain level, but if you don't use a stereo steel, um, then it won't work. And I would say ironwood, a stereo steel, I still think ironwood, a stereo steel or magic for me, but I would leave it to the DM's uh, discretion depending on the system that they're using. The only reason is I don't want... Uh, the characters or the players that cho that chose characters that aren't really melee characters or aren't wielding melee weapons that are maybe someone wanted to play more like a monk or something, you know, like you, you can make it work for whatever the character classes are, but totally adjust as needed. Um, so I say, I say magic, but the finishing blows of the steel makes a lot of sense. I, it does work. So let me, let me think through that. I'll noodle it a little bit and see how that might work here. Um, because even uh, there's ways of even doing the magic through a stereo steel as a focus might be a good way to do that. Like even using like when you cast something using that like an amulet made out of a stereo steel or using, um, you know, some other weapon like that. I don't know. We'll, we'll think it through. But I, I, I love the ideas that are coming up here. Um, awesome. All right, I am going to, I know this was a short one, but I want to make sure that I had a chance to kind of get this kicked off and I'm going to do multiple of these. I might uh, keep this going each Monday at about the same time, uh, just because the timing seems about right. Um, so uh, I'll send out new links as we go. But if you don't make it uh, to the live session, again, I will uh, be publishing the um uh, publishing the uh, recording for later. Wands and staffs, yeah, absolutely. You could use wands and staffs, uh, gloves, amulets, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think both of you are on the right track with that. So um, yeah, we'll 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 see how this goes, and we'll add to this as we have more time. I do want to kind of mention that uh, as far as the setting presentations, material updates, artwork, and that kind of stuff, it's likely going to be towards the end <laughs> when I start really getting to the point where I can put this together that I'll do some final stuff. But 
I do want to include some at least basic maps and visuals to be inspiration for any adventures or other um, steps that we do forward. I'll be honest, it depends on how this takes off and what I can pull together for this. I don't know if I'm eventually going to do this as a Kickstarter. If we go with actually getting this published uh, by a publishing company or if we're going to do this self-published, uh, probably will be self-published. But I do want this to be something that people can get through either digitally, like we can do something as a download or an actual physical product would be amazing. So, but at either rate, I need to have, I really want to have someone that is professional with their artwork and layouts and things like that to make this a really solid design. Um, so yeah, so luckily I have a few people that I know now <laughs> with uh, publishing. I've uh, We've had some... Uh, partnerships uh, from the perspective of I've had books I've reviewed and so I know some of the people that are there now I can reach out to them and ask for um, what are some best practices with that so I'm gathering information we'll see what we can do but you know yeah this will be a uh, you know a, um, a an effort between all of us putting our heads together and me really trying to drive this to make it go home it'll be something that I hope we'll all be proud of that we had a part of so um all right. Well, I think uh, it was a good start for getting this going. Um, by the next time we go through this, I'm going to revise some things. I'm going to hope to put out in the next link I send out for the next uh, live stream. Uh, I'm going to try to put out a supplementary packet to kind of go through some of the changes that we talked about um, by next time that we launch this. And then we'll keep iterating until we get something that looks good. Um, I appreciate, especially Ben, you, you and your family playtesting and uh, doing what you do because that's the best way to know how this is going to actually um, work with the kids, right? It's, it's hard developing games for kids to see how they um, make it work. So, awesome. All right. Well, uh, I think that's going to be it for today. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for watching. If you're catching this after the fact, thanks for joining or and watching. Uh, the recording again hit the comments let me know what you think uh, if you're just come stumbling across this I'll have links to the other videos explaining this in more detail and how you can sign up for the playtest to get the playtest packet and all the stuff that we've been talking about that we are revising so you can at least get that version to uh, dig into all right everybody thanks so much and uh, we'll catch you next time cheers <laughs>